Now I'll begin to start off with a rhetorical question. Have you ever met, or would you not find it strange if you were to meet a French child who was born and bred in France, uh, was schooled in a French government endorsed uh, you know, curriculum, yet cannot speak French uh, and did history, but cannot tell you anything deeply substantial about French national history? Now I worry because I feel that that's somehow where our um, African children are heading to. Now, after years of African slavery, Namibia's 20-odd years of independence from both the colonial and apartheid regime, as well as a continent that is flourishing with so many opportunities today, my desire is to share with you what I believe are some of our secrets to unleashing Africa's potential. Now, as important as it is for us to call upon each other as Africans to rise, innovate, and build is, I think it's just as important that we begin to look and analyze how we plan on creating a sense of African self-determination and African self-actualization as a people in order for us to progress. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized the need for genuine discourse amongst ourselves as the African youth and as well as to the youth to our elders as to what we deem to be the progression of African self-determination. I'll start off with language and cultural preservation. I remember being in fourth grade and uh, my teacher came up to me and told me, okay, now it's a new year, it's time, you have to start learning Afrikaans. Now, for our global community that's watching this, Afrikaans is a, an originally Dutch-based language spoken by originally white settlers that settled both in Namibia and South Africa. Um, I remember asking her, okay, but you know, why can't I learn my mother tongue of Oshuamba at school? And she said, well, that, that's just not possible, right? Now, it appears to me that there might be a passivity to some superimposed pre-colonial policies that were put back in the day, um, and which somehow still continue to till today, right? And I've heard that the argument, I've heard some arguments that say it's in the name of civilization and the like, of which I'm quick to mention the shallowness of it all, for I'm yet to see a civilized society that did not embrace its cultural heritage and mainly its languages. Recently, I was in South Africa and, uh, well, I left Namibia and I went to South Africa and I met a guy by the name of Matthew. But before I tell you that story, I suppose one argument with the civilization point is that the irony of it all is that the, the, the countries that we wish to imitate in the name of civilization, they protect their cultures. They protect their cultures so much so that sometimes they won't even render someone a visa to come into their country sometimes if someone doesn't have competent knowledge of their language, right? Now, back to Matthew. Now, Matthew is a South African uh, with uh, English heritage, and he went to a primary school where he had the opportunity to learn Isi Zulu. And he was telling me how when he got to high school, he was no longer offered the opportunity, well, or rather the school just didn't offer Isi Zulu to teach. And he said to me that being a white African, Teleni, I feel that learning a purely African language is an integral part of me proclaiming my African identity as a white person, yet I wasn't offered the opportunity to excel in a purely African language. Now, I was tempted to joke to him that here I am, you know, a young Namibian lady, born and bred in Namibia and having schooled here as well, but I also wasn't offered the opportunity to learn my mother tongue at school. So, although I too speak two uh, dialects of my language fairly well, and I made the conscious decision to begin reading and writing my language, I have to admit that I somehow feel that my reading and my speaking is sometimes uh, still wanting, and I desire to one day read bedtime stories in Oshiwambo to my children one day, and it kind of pains me that, well, you know, I don't know, I'm not that excellent at it, right? right? Um, this also goes to speak into the continued and possibly perpetuated systematic extinction of our African languages, which really, really bothers me. I also wonder sometimes whether um, our, you know, the German kids born and bred in Namibia and whom I schooled with uh, would easily and gladly learn a purely Namibian language in their school, be it Oshirero, Damara, or even Rakangwali, as I, the Owambo child, had no option or was given no other option but to learn their language in my school. Now, let I not be misunderstood. The notion of increasing one's lingual capacity by learning non-native languages is a beautiful one, and, I, and I'm totally for it, right? 
It's also fair to mention that I am aware that there are some schools that do offer indigenous languages in our schools, uh, sometimes on a mandatory basis and sometimes more so in our urban areas on an optional basis. But then again, I challenge our elders that next time when they ask us why we misspelt a native word while we reply to them on an SMS, are you coming home? Maybe I challenge them that they maybe ought to ask our schools why they're not prioritizing teaching their kids how to read and write the native language. I also challenge our elders that next time um, they ask uh, you know, us why our peers are wearing weaves of Western and uh, Eastern origin, I challenge them that they first ask the schools why some of them still uphold policies that allow for them to forbid, expel, and even threaten black girls who come to school in their natural hair, in locks, and even braids. And to be quite honest, sometimes I question how constitutionally sound some of those school policies are, because when you think about it, there's the constitutional right to not be discriminated by race, and there's the, the our constitution upholds cultural spirit and encourages, you know, for our cultural spirit. And so I think about, okay, but here's this black girl rocking her black hair, and, and now she's being sent home. Would she be sent home if she wore a weave? Now, it's not so much about my preference to hair, clothing, or language, as it, is to, as it is the need to record, protect, and preserve our African identity, and yeah, our African identity as a people, really. So let me move on to my next point, African history. I believe there's a huge need for Africans to really, really write their own stories, our own truths, and that we begin to teach our children the stories of our warriors, the change makers, and the pioneers of our African lands. And I don't mean a simple, like, one or two page summary of what Oliver Tambo or Mandemu Demfayo did for our lands, but an intensive, intensive teaching on our forefathers. I have friends who schooled in African schools, be it Namibia or where else, yet can go to university uh, having written local and international exams, history exams, yet can go to university and not being able to tell in all confidence and fullness what Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Malcolm X, Bram Fisher, or even Sam Yoma did for our African lands. And sadly, in comparison, they're more likely to be knowledgeable on Western and even Eastern history as prescribed by our general uh, curriculums. Now, I don't believe it would be wise for us not to teach uh, Western and even Eastern history. Yet I, I ask and I beg for us that we ought to question how we plan on painting our walls as Africans with our walls with self-determination and self-actualizations as Africans if we're not teaching our children where they're fully coming from in order to equip and catapult them to where we wish them to go. So I beg to ask, as a child, as an African youth, who is writing the stories that we're teaching our children? Because I'm not seeing enough glory, enough celebration, and enough sincere documentation of the struggles we fought, the battles we won, and are winning as an independent Namibia and a uh, more free Africa. As recently quoted by the late Kumla Dumar, until a lion learns how to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. And we have so many of our historic libraries dying on a daily when we bury one of our elders. I strongly believe that we need more of our Namibian writers, such as the likes of Ellen Namilla, who wrote The Price of Freedom, and Kaleni Hiyalwa, who wrote Mekulu's Children, as well as amazing Chimamanda Gozi Adichie, the late Chinu Achebe, and even Maya Angelou should be more of our prescribed literature within our Afri African schools, not only here, but in the diaspora. I was mainly offered Western um, literature in high school and even primary school, of, of which were lovely, yet the dying thirst to know and read about our African stories had to be filled from the shelves of my parents' book collections. Now, I believe we need to realize that we make the fight for progression as a people, as an African people, twice as hard, again, if we do not teach ourselves who we are and where we're coming from. And then we move on. <clears throat> the times and the changes. 
Just recently, while the world celebrated Tatekulu Nelson Mandela's life, on, on the day of his memorial service, I was in the village uh, um, at my grandmother's homestead, and I was seated under the tree with her, uh, cracking a marula nuts while listening to the radio, her battery charged radio, to get updates on the memorial service. Now, there was no option for Twitter updates for me in that moment, because, I mean, the nearest electricity hub was a nearby cooker shop where my phone had been sent to get charged. Now, this leads me to a crucial point that needs to be duly acknowledged and properly understood. Namibia, alongside some other similar countries, stands as one of the countries that uh, experienced about three ages within three consecutive generations. So we have Mekulus and Tatekulus, which means grandmothers and grandfathers, who grew up in the agrarian age, in its peak and in its last days. We have our parents who um, were the first to, it, well, like for instance, my parents were the first to have gone to formal education, the first in their entire bloodline. So all the way from primary education to becoming Ivy League graduates like my mom. And then you get my peers who are of the digital slash information age and uh, might obtain a qualification, yet that doesn't necessarily equate to financial success and a well-paying job. So while more of, our, while more of the well-developed countries might have experienced one age over several generations of a people, we went through it really fast. So that leaves us with Mekulus who are amazed at how a baby knows how to operate this weird human invention called an iPad. We have fathers struggling how to teach their children financial wisdom in a capitalist-run economy because it is their first time living out this model of living. And then you get young boys and girls, or toddlers turned young boys and girls, who um, will protest to you as to why they do not have to learn the multiplications table off by heart, because they are so sure that the calculator is not going to become extinct anytime soon in the digital age we're in. <laughs> and I've heard those arguments before. Now, it might sound lighthearted, and it really holds its beauties, but but the essential thing that we need to understand here is that we have elders specialized in industrial age-based teaching methods and that are creating and teaching curriculums in this industrial age-based way to children who are fast moving away from that way of thinking or doing. Uh, I have a huge and burning passion for education, having parents that are both educators in their own right. And I believe that the time has come for us to acknowledge that the world is no longer looking for children who can quote the definition of photosynthesis as written verbatim from an encyclopedic textbook, but rather the child who knows how to use Google and not just find out what the definition of photosynthesis is, but also give the teacher the scientific formula of chlorophyll. So, considering all of this, this would really mean reshaping the way we, in which we teach our children on the four pillars that research has identified today. So, our education. The four pillars would be how to think, encouraging kids to think creativity, cre well, encouraging creativity, uh, critical uh, analysis, problem solving, decision making, and the like, and learning as opposed to regurgitating. Number two, how to work, emphasizing communication and, and collaboration through more project-based learning without, of course, removing the importance of individual and introspective learning time. Number three, tools for working. Beyond the basics of, of um, reading, writing, and counting, also ensuring ICT literacy for the kids to be able to use technology as a tool, not only to research, but organize and communicate effectively. And lastly, the skills for um, living in the 21st century. So creating environments, that the schools create environments that help, the ch that help to foster within the children not only academic intelligence, but emotional intelligence, financial intelligence, allowing the kids to um, know of spiritual awareness, teaching them healthy lifestyle living, teaching them personal as well as social responsibilities and their civil rights and duties as a people of a nation. Whenever I think of Namibia, I'm tempted to think of, of Singapore's educational success story. We have Sir Lee Kuan Yew, um, who 
it revamped the entire uh, nation on education, uh, customizing it, and who had an unquestionable tenacity to excellence on a national education level. So now, being a professional in the television and broadcast industry, as well as having a passion for education, I'm asking us to take seriously, us as Africans, the making and broadcasting of our own stories. This will help us educate, inspire, and understand each other more. I've heard that the telling of a story is known to increase one's emotional intelligence by double the percentage than that of simply releasing facts to someone in the hope that it'll influence them and change their mind. Now, the media and the arts is used to reflect to people who they are, where they come from, what their struggles are, their aspirations, their failures and successes. Now, it would be unfair for me to leave the stage tonight without congratulating and just really giving praise to our Nigerian brothers and sisters, for they have truly spearheaded us as Africans, African storytelling, into a new wave of sharing our stories. And it's exciting to see a people who, after so long, have been starved of dignity and self-actualization, we're finally being able to tell our stories, um, our way, for us, for our consumption. And I believe it is so necessary, for it is truly Africa's time. Therefore, before I walk off the stage tonight, I would like to leave you with my propositions, my ideas worth sharing, in order for us to unleash our potential as Africans further. One, by proactively protecting and encouraging our African identity within our very schools. This means teaching our languages and allowing kids to withhold and, 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 and keep their cultural heritage in the schools. Number two, to develop and nurture our African writers and our stories. It's about time that we teach our children our African stories written by us and taking it seriously, as seriously as we ensure to teach them the stories of others. Number three, to acknowledge the truth of the 21st century as well as holistic education. This will help us in getting to the knowledge-based economies many of our African countries wish to enter into. And number four, continuing the movement of African storytelling. So the making, the broadcasting, and the distribution, all intentionally so, so as to teach ourselves who we are and also teach the rest of the world who we truly are and not just what seems to be dictated by the global media of what Africa is, starving children and the like. So I believe what we teach our children, how we teach them, and whom we allow to dictate our realities to us as a people are the ingredients to releasing Africa's potency further. And those are my ideas worth sharing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>